All right, hello and welcome back to the 20th episode of Rebound with Resilience, a podcast dedicated to raise your resilience, mindset, and mental wellness. And on today's episode, I am excited and privileged and grateful to have with us a guest with a big presence and an even bigger heart, uh, Dr. Chi Soon Juan. Hi, Dr. Chi. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Just been uh, looking at some of the things that you've done. Just want to say doing something that I think it's very useful and very important. So I'm just glad to be here. Sure. Thank you so much. That, that meant a lot to me. You know, I really do respect you. And uh, thanks for taking the time to speak to just a random uh, person like me. Um, I'm just look, looking forward to host you to the best that I can. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So before we begin, uh, just allow me to just give an introduction of how we connected and also the outline of this podcast as well. If so it was back in 2015, I think, when I first came across uh, who you are. I think it was a rally speech in 4th September, right? Uh, and you were speaking about having the courage to dream, right? To dream of a more compassionate, a more humane society. And you spoke about, I think you shared a story about how you almost hit um, an elderly with pushing the cardboard. You know, you spoke about giving a voice to the voiceless. You spoke about, you know, raising your kids to be scholars. You know, not just scholars in math and science, but also in caring for other people. And back then, I knew nothing about you, but I, something about the speech just resonated with me, you know. And, and back then, I had just overcome some mental health issues. So I had a dream to really build a more resilient, inclusive, compassionate society, to do it through speaking and media. And basically to raise, like you mentioned, right, awareness of mental health issues, especially among youth, to let them know that they're not defined by their grades and just a piece of paper. And uh, I think when I researched more about your story and looked at how you pursued your dream despite the odds, it really gave me that courage to dream. And five years later, um, starting a podcast and having you here is just very surreal. So to thank you so much for, for being that, um, that inspiration to me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, again, thanks for just um, having me here. It's just been very important that in a society like ours, where there's this pursuit of material gains, not that there's anything wrong with that, um, but there must be a, a counter side to that um, to make us all just more rounded individuals, not people just pursuing you know, wealth for the sake of wealth. Uh, there's this element that makes us human. And if you don't have that part of it, that humanity, it's, it's scary to think that a society devoid of humanity, and that's just not a society worth pursuing. Yep. Yeah, definitely. In fact, there's this some of the themes that we're going to talk about today as well. Um, just allow me to give the guest, uh, the guest, the viewers, an outline of the podcast. So I think today we will, uh, it's not going to be very politically inclined. It's more from a humanistic angle uh, where I think all of us know Dr. Chi as an established politician, but fewer of us know him as, um, who he is as who he is as a father, as a friend, as a person. So today I'm going to ask Dr. Chi about uh, his upbringing, his motivations, his family. And then in line with the podcast team, we'll also discuss issues on mental health, resilience, youth, and education. Okay, themes that are quite important in today's society. So yes, I'm ready <laughs> to begin. Are you ready, Dr. Chi? I know you're always ready. <laughs> Ready as you are. Ready as you okay. Are. So I think the first question I'd like to ask is, I think you're such a convicted and, and visionary, a confident speaker and how you hold yourself. But I'm curious to know how you were like as a kid, you know, as a student back in school, right? How were you like? Uh, were you really a rebel <laughs> back then? Yeah. You know, looking back, I, I guess cannot remember any instance or even a period mm. um, where I stood out or had any inkling of what I really wanted to do. Sure. In other words, I was like very, every other normal kid um, and didn't really stand out, mm. didn't really excel. But at the same time, I can't say that I, I struggled or, or straggled behind okay. my peers. So it was a rather uh, mundane, rather uneventful kind of uh, childhood that I went through. To the point that that they're almost bordering on the, on the, boring. Sure. But of course, I mean, I had my moments. You yeah. Know, during like those days know. when, 
you know, there wasn't all the gadgets and gizmos that you had ready in your palm. We, we found our own fun device, our own games to play. Um, and there was a time that I, I look back with, with fondness and uh, perhaps maybe something that you kind of romanticize even. Sure. But it was, it was a, a period which I enjoyed. I, I really did. Um, but never thought too much about, you know, other than, right. you know, going through your daily fun and hanging out with your friends sure. and so on. Although some of my friends might back to defer. So, okay. uh, <laughs> what, was one activity, me, what was one activity that you remember doing for fun with your friends? It's, it's, I remember marbles was okay. one thing. I don't know why. Yeah. Chate, of course, was right. the in thing at that time as well. So sometimes I go to school without uh, uh, marbles in my pocket and then you go on and you kind of borrow here, there and hustle a little bit <laughs> and then you go on and you win some ah, uh, okay. games yeah. and then go home with a pocket full. Okay. And that was the achievement for the day. But um, it, was, it was also fun. And it just also, of course, you know, boys being who we are, going to a few fisticuffs ourselves mm. as well. So those were the days and it's almost like a rite of passage. Right. You've right. got to, to show your, your, you know, your, worth, right? your, your feistiness and, and making sure you st- stood up for yourself and that kind of thing. So it was all, all in all, great time. Sure. No regrets. And how were your, your parents like? Were they very strict with you, more liberal at that time? When we were in primary school, I used to remember my mother would, would be there, you know, cane in hand, <laughs> okay. uh, making sure that my spelling was always, you know, up to par. And, okay. and every time you make a mistake, oh my goodness, the cane would be sitting right there. And in between sobs of trying to get your your spelling correct you know she'd be there making sure she's mm. breathing down your neck but you wow. know yeah. those were, were some of the times where you know parents could still do that and, and with with again looking back with great fondness mm. in the sense of just very happy that I had that kind of a childhood parents back with mom there as well mm. so it's something which um, I want to continue to be able to have our kids today, you know, experience. Yeah. It's a lifetime. It's a once in a lifetime kind sure. of thing. And it's a shame that we cannot enjoy um, our childhood as much as, yeah. as we yeah. did before. You know, back in my parents' day as well, you always talk about marbles, about catching spiders, that kampong spirit. Um, that a lot, I guess along the way, has lost it. we've lost it a bit, slightly. I look back at even, for example, the school that I was in, primary school, secondary mm-hmm. school, um, the camp, the school that we had in Barker Road. Um, and I went back recently to visit because my son is studying there right now. And even physically, the buildings, you know, there was no space for any you know, field, spaces where we could really just go out and, like you said, catch spiders and, and just play hantam bola, you know, <laughs> during... Um, recess all this makes a difference in terms of how psychologically how you grow up as well how you see society how you interact with your peers and it does have an effect so speaking uh, about your parents as well was there anything that you treasure or any principle that you still treasure today that they have taught you i guess it's always you know with my mom she's very much a traditional uh, parent growing up she just wants you to walk the straight and narrow uh, make sure you you get your grades up there don't slack you know in terms of our classroom performance uh, but beyond that she never really had any she imposed her will her expectations on us and that one that is one aspect that i found it uh, tremendously um beneficial in terms of how you we, we grew up and never really had that kind of pressure that we had to be what she wanted us to be but it's something which again i remember that it was a time that allowed us to to grow and develop as ourselves the people that person that we wanted to be and it was a 
period where we were we finding ourselves. And I, all I can remember is during my later years, the secondary school, going into JC, I, I started getting very, I don't know if I can use the word disillusioned, but all the memory work, all the pressure, just having to regurgitate all the information that we, we picked up in the classroom. Uh, it was just not something which I felt that I could, I could master. Mm. So as I've said it, you know, on yeah. other occasions, um, I, I distinctly, distinctly remember walk, sleepwalking through my A-levels mm. and just found the two years really quite uninspiring, uh, not moving forward yet, you know, can't really, and not, not yeah. falling back as well. So just doing what I can just to survive. Sure. In the way you like felt straight jacketed, right? You felt... Very, very much so. And, and they, all they did was just make sure that you did what you did to get mm. through the A-levels and to what end, you know, no, nobody ever told you and you couldn't figure out yourself being at that age itself. You did not quite know what you wanted to be or wanted to do uh, thereafter. So you just basically there to get your grades and then see. Mm, okay. In fact, we are going to talk about education a little bit later on. Um, but I guess coming back, right, to, um, you know, I'd like to extend my condolences as well. I know that your mom recently passed away. Thank you. Um, and, and I do believe that she would be very proud of, of what you have done. Yeah. Um, I think I, I read a book by Jeslyn. She was mentioning about how your mom attends every rally, you know. <laughs> Yeah, again, you know, when I first told her uh, uh, that I was going to um, get into the opposition politics, uh, she hit the, uh, the, the roof and then, wow, you know, as all, all mothers <laughs> would, right? In Singapore, are you crazy? You know, that kind of thing. And uh, I suppose through the years, um, began to tell her why it was important for us to do what mm. we needed to do. And if you believe uh, what you do is just and right, then don't worry about what other, how other people saw you and what they said. Right. Um, just make sure you you had your goal and stay focused to 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 get it. Sure. Yeah, it's a pity she didn't you know see you in parliament. But you know, I, like I said, you know, I I do believe that she's very proud of you. And I've, in fact, Justin did write that. Uh, that, you know, certain times when she, she read about you in, in, in the press, she got a bit concerned and she expressed that concern to Jaslyn and she actually gave her a hug and told her it's going to be fine. Yeah. Did she ever express that concern to you? On occasion, on occasion, but the rest of the times, I'm pretty sure she was there, but she knew that it wasn't easy for me to. She didn't want to make it even more burdensome okay. than it had to be for me. So if she were trying to put up a brave front as mm. well. And I would also, sure. you know, do that the same with her and say, hey, look, my mom, don't worry about it. It's okay. Mm. But, you know, unspoken yeah. was when I knew she was worried about what I was going through. But she would always be there. And, and um, just with quiet fortitude, she saw it through the years. Yeah. I'm just, again, saddened by the fact that I couldn't show in time that things um, would have turned out, had turned out any better. But uh, yeah, I suppose she knew that the journey was just as important as the destination. Okay. And thank you for sharing. Thank you for your vulnerability in sharing, Dr. Chi. Um, I guess we could move on to talk about your family. You know, I think like you said, how your mom parented you were also in a way affected how you parented uh, and how you keep your family together. And, I'm, and I'm, I must say that I've watched a bit too many videos of you and your family on YouTube because it's, it's very heartwarming. You know, and I think to give some context to the next question, I think it's not easy to raise a family in Singapore. You know, I, I mean, I don't have kids, but I have two younger siblings. I know it's not easy for my parents. Singapore is expensive. Kids have their own mind sometimes. And on top of that, you also had so much pressure over the years, you know, financial, um, emotional, public pressure. And despite all that, you, you keep your family together. You're so united as a family. Your wife stands by you. Your kids, 
you can see in their eyes that they love and they respect you as a father. You know? So, I would like to ask, right, what are some principles or practices that has helped you to keep your family together? Never leave them where, leave that gap where communication is not there. Mm. Um, and by communication, I, I just don't mean you just talking to them mm. and lecturing them. Sometimes just even being there, just let them know that, hey, you know, if you've got any, any one time, whether it's school work or whether it's your friends in school, just let them know, hey, uh, Papa is here. You, you can, I'm always, mom is always there. And just let them know that there's always this uh, net over there. Sure. That no matter how, how high they jump and when they jump high, there's always a chance that they'll fall back down again. And when they do, to make sure you're there. And let them find their own way as they go forward. Okay. But is this, I remember this thought that uh, my mom was always there. Sure. Uh, no matter what we did. Uh, and in these last few weeks, you know, even though I'm already close to 60, but we've had her all our lives, mm. that when she's no longer there, you feel that, that emptiness, that void in there. And it's that same kind of, of security, knowing that, Mm. somehow your parent sure. your mom your parents are always there that gives one that, that little bit more courage to be able to go out and foray into uh, uncharted waters la. and just to find yourself discover yourselves and I think basically that's what parents should be should there be. for okay. just to give the children that little confidence yeah. that trust that they can go out and, and do what they want to do and then if ever there are hard times again, you know, mom and dad are there to provide a bit of, of, of comfort, mm -hmm. solace, and if needed, then some guidance. Sure. In that sense, can I say your the way your parenting style is not imposing? Like you said, you just give them that freedom to make their own decisions. Because a lot of parents in Singapore sometimes they find the need to, you know, control. Oh no, them. no, no, not that, that the the tendency is not there. Yeah. You know that somehow nature is, is such <laughs> yeah. that you always want to tell the kids, hey, you know, do yeah. this, not that, because knowing yeah. this, you can't escape that. Sure. And uh, uh, I suppose it's just important sometimes as well uh, to let them know that there are boundaries as well. Mm. And if you're going, to, if you know what lies ahead, mm. uh, you try to tell them, but there's a difference between kind, kind of uh, uh, educating them uh, and, and advising, counselling, rather than imposing strict yes, no, that kind of thing. Because after all, at some point, they need to figure out for themselves uh, what is yeah. where the limits are. Mm -hmm. And it's also by just discovering and then sometimes falling down and picking themselves up that, that we all learn uh, in, in terms of how to move ahead and how to you know modify our behaviour so that we get the best out of our lives. Yeah. Is there any value um, that you strove to inculcate in, in your kids? The one thing that I really always um, at least wanted to be able to impart to them and for them to imbue is to um, make sure that this whole idea that you don't live for yourselves um, as much as you can gather and amass, you know, whether it's material gains or even just uh, emotional aspects of life, if you just wanted to hoard it all for yourselves, you find yourself coming um, the much poorer for it. Mm. And you, you know that it's this saying, that it's better to give than to receive. You know, it may be a bit cliched, but there's a lot of truth in that, now, which I found it at least when it, applies to me that sometimes just to see other people around you you know benefit from right. what you can help them with whether it's my students and remember once I was teaching every time you see your students mm -hmm. the eyes light oh, up when they it, understand yes. a concept which you're trying to get across yes. that as a, as a teacher sometimes you know it makes your day just yeah yeah it's right? a sparkle of gratitude in the eyes right? you can see it <laughs> right. so that, that that's a kind of a feeling 
And, and when you extend beyond uh, uh, teaching, you get people to light up in terms of what you have been able to uh, provide them, even in a transient manner, that helps. And I just want my kids also to be able to experience that. And then the other aspect of life is also, look, you're going to meet in life with more rejection uh, than with acceptance or at least success. Never be um, deterred. And the other idea is that whether it's praise or whether it's criticism, I've always said, when people praise you, don't let it go to your head. When people criticize you, don't let it get to your heart. Um, Just continue to believe in yourself and what you're doing. And if you figured it out, then continue to be determined and and focused and and stay stay on track. Sure. Have they... Uh, this is a, quite a stupid question. <laughs> I'm sure they disagree sometimes, but you know, do they have disagreements or do they challenge you in any sense? No, <laughs> you know, when when they were little, you know, little meaning in primary school, anything you wanted them to do, they're always yeah. there. And then, you know, every time when Papa makes a joke, it's always funny, mm. right? And then they get their teenage years, and then it's going to become dad jokes already, and they'll be. <laughs> Uh, lame and so on and so forth but you know that's all the whole process of growing up and you know they can begin to have formed their own views have their own minds and that's one thing you want to encourage as well I remember when they were little and I still give them a ribbing about it and they never fail to remind me of it then I'll get them now give their yeah. haircuts you know right. because when they're little yeah. it's hard to bring them to that and then they won't sit still that kind of thing yeah. so you know if, now and then on weekends, I get them and say, come on, sit down here, and I'll just give them a haircut. And oh, my, and that time they didn't, they, they had merrily went along their way and just be very happy. But then when they look back, oh my gosh, Papa, what did you do to us and our hair and that kind of thing. And then, you know, the, all this part and parcel of growing up. So sure. they begin to find, hey, you know, we want to do things on our own, yeah. have our own views and that kind of thing. So, but if that is part of nature. Yeah. They grow up and, and uh, it makes no difference to how you interact with them in terms of, you know, you're, you're continuing to care for them, uh, to love them, you know, sure. unconditionally sometimes. So sure. It's important to remember right. those, those virtues. Yeah. And I think you do spend, you enjoy spending your time with them, right? You, you said it a lot in other interviews, just being present with them, giving them that time, you know, no matter how busy you are in your other areas. Um, I, I won't say compartment. I won't say compartmentalizing. It's more of when you're in that moment with them. It's just them, you know. Is that difficult to do sometimes? Because especially you know in Singapore, when there's so many things going on, with parents especially, how do they then, you know, do they have any advice for parents to just be present when they're with their kids? It is harder, I, I suppose, when now you're to really talking about many of the households and families have double income in terms of mom and dad having to go to work too. Um, I, you know, it, it's, I, I don't want to come across sounding very preachy, but for me, I can only speak from my own experience that, um, to me, it's always family that you've got to make sure that you are there to give them the time. And I'd like to, be able to, if I ever had people, we always like to make sure that on weekends, that's family time. When you come back from work, that's family time. Uh, I, I do recognize that there are certain careers and jobs which you have to work you know, on weekends and, and, and after work, work hours. But it's important to always mm. uh, try to remember that there must be times when you leave put aside must be sacred in that sense sure. it cannot be touched okay. so even as, as I said during for, for us as in, in politics sometimes during the weekends it's only the only time yeah. when you can go out and meet residents and that kind of thing but even then uh, um, you try to make sure that you apportion your time in such a way that you get to spend it with your family and make sure okay. that Sunday or even Saturdays are just times when you get to, to, to spend with and that nothing comes between sure. you and them. I appreciate that. I mean, in fact, I guess rounding out this segment, is there one uh, message you'd like to share with your, your family? 
that um, I love them very much and that, you know, we shouldn't be sometimes in this hustle and bustle of daily lives that we don't express our uh, words to each other enough. Mm. So the couple of times when, you know, there's this yeah. very stereotypical thing of dads, like, you know, we're not good at, at messaging and, and sure. so on. But every now and then, um, there was once I, I, I wrote a message to my daughter and said, you know, uh, sent her a little message, said, you know, I'm still here and that kind of thing. And in the end, I, I signed off, Papa. Mm. And then she replied, you don't have to sign off because <laughs> <laughs> it's you. Then I didn't think about it. I said, yeah, you, you're right. But then sometimes even just dropping a little note into, you know, on the table, telling them, yeah, you know, I'm here. So if it's anything you need, just let me know. And I love you very much. Those are the things I don't think we should take for granted. Mm. Okay, la, they know, la, they know that yeah. I'm always there, that kind of thing. But sometimes just let them know. And it's nice. I love for uh, receiving these little notes from them as well. Sure. And not just on, on special occasions like their birthdays and, and, you know, but in between sometimes it's good just to, to you know, sure. drop little notes to each other, that yeah. kind of thing. Okay, I guess that concludes our segment on family and upbringing. Thank you so much. I learned, I mean, it's really heartwarming listening to you. Um, and yeah, so I think moving on to, to the next segment, which is on resilience and mental health. I think you're known most distinctly for your resilience and your tenacity to just stand up regardless of whatever that knocks you down. But I'm sure there are moments in time where you felt defeated or, you know, your mental health was compromised. Is it right to say that or no? Oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no, without a, without a doubt. I mean, you know, there'd be more than one occasion when you really um, was at your wit's end and you just thought that you were end, at the end of the rope and you didn't have any more... Um, to go on, running on empty, you know, use whatever metaphor you wanted. Um, there were many times uh, when it felt like you just couldn't go on anymore. Um, and it's not because of your own lack of resources, but because of you know, your opponents being there and making sure that um, you did not succeed. But those were the times when also if you give yourself a time to do whatever you want, you know, take a break, sit down, cry your heart out. It, at the end of the day, you just needed to pick yourself up, dry your tears, and then uh, be able to tell yourself again that you've got what doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. And that again cannot just be just an adage or just a cute saying that people, but it must be the philosophy of your life and to make sure that you believe it. And I have seen uh, going through the years and you learn and you've got to be, resilience is just one part of making sure that how you go on, but the other one is just to whatever you've, um, had to go through but not really done well enough to learn from it and in that sense continue to adapt and grow and become better and better at what you do were there any one or two moments where you distinctly remember where it was really really difficult those w uh, were the years where uh, there was no social media no facebook uh, youtube where you could just you know yeah. use your handphone just to record things that you wanted to say and you were at the mercy, at least I was, uh, with as far as the traditional media, print media, the broadcast media. And uh, they, whatever they wanted to say of you and paint of you, mm. you literally didn't they have control very it. much that you could counter with. So it was depressing at one stage. Um, and then when CNA just kept scrolling headlines about you going back and forth, and I remember even at that time, generally, Singaporeans were still largely very afraid, unlike the today. And they would just see you from afar and they would just kind of avoid you and not really come up to, to encourage you and give you a bit more of, of spirit to, 
go on. So though those were the days where it was particularly difficult, um, and there were moments when I remember just you know just my wife and I. Um, it was a very trying period. I must say, it was a very trying period. Do you have any impact on your kids as well uh, in during that period, or you try to keep it separate as much as you could? In the early days, in the early years, uh, they were little. They were young to really realize, you know, what was uh, going on. And I remember when I was in prison, they came to visit me. But you know, they were at that time we opted for a TV kind of a, a meetup, so it wasn't like over a glass thing that you watched on uh, TV. Although there was this yeah. facility, but it was a lot more difficult. And just talking to my wife, there was not very optimal. So we opted for a TV kind of thing, and they were in this aircon room, and they saw me on the camera, and didn't know what's going on. So they were jumping up and hi, Papa. They were just waving. I didn't know that you know it was prison that kind of thing. And uh, I then slowly, as they they were growing up, then we started explaining to them, and they they could understand what I was trying to to do. And it was a, a period where okay, like we weren't exactly worried. You just wanted to make sure that we communicated with them, and just told them about what, um, in in a language that they could understand. Telling them sometimes it's important uh, to do what you believe is right, no matter even your friends uh, are not happy with you, um, but you've got to do what you believe is to be right. So that part of what we managed to navigate in such a way that would, the impact wasn't too great on them. And I think you did share in an interview as well that you wanted to reach out to help them through that camera, but but you know in that in that moment you couldn't, and it was tough, lah. At least at that, that it moment. was. I mean, any father will tell you that you know well, having your children around you sometimes you know the physical contact with them, and that was something which I missed tremendously. But I suppose you always make up for it, and. Whenever they could, I remember when they were little. I used to also drag them out when I was selling books, for example. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. this is where I first met you as well. Was <laughs> it really? Tampani, Tampani's, uh, outside Tampani's MRT. That was yes, <laughs> the, 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 the outside the MRT <laughs> yes. station, right? Yes, yeah. So and they were little at that time. Probably some of them were, were, were a couple of them were in, in still in kindergarten. So we went there, and you know, you you teach them how to when somebody wants to buy the book, you know, they'll tell them oh how much it was. And then you know, people will go up to them, hand them the money, and then they will count and make sure it's right. So they were doing their arithmetic as well. It was a lot of fun. And then also, we, I took them on. I remember doing one national days. They were very little, and they were just handing out flyers. Okay. And people would just come around to them and say, hey, you know, and just take a copy from them. So you know, they kind of. And, and then on occasion, we had I don't know if you know, we had this mascot called Danny, the bear, right. the democracy bear. Okay. <laughs> And so when the, the bear puts on his head, yeah. you know, he can't see very well and something okay. the steps, you know. So make sure I get them to be the bear leader. <laughs> and uh, they would hold the bear's hand and just lead them. Then when the steps are coming up, say, oh, watch out, steps coming up. Yeah. So there are roles for them to play, you know, sure. even when they were little. And, and I think what's, what's really, I keep using the word heartwarming because like, I don't know any other word to use, but there was a video that they made for you, I think on your 50th birthday, a compilation <laughs> of photos. <laughs> and, and, one, and one particular photo, it, was, it told so much. There's one particular photo of them taking like, a selfie outside Queenstown Remand Prison. And they added that in. And, and it spoke volumes because they knew, I think they just knew that, that like you said, it's part of something that you had to do. They had no... Like crumbs about it and, and they supported you fully in that sense. So, I mean, even though it was just a picture, it spoke so much. Yeah. yeah. My eldest daughter, like, at that time, she was a little bigger so she could understand. Um, you know, and, and then sometimes at night, they'll have vigils for me outside the prison. But of course, you know, they'd be there to play with their, their little candles and, and have their own fun. But and I suppose it's the things like that, that they are teaching, teachable moments as well. Um, you don't always learn in the classroom. So uh, she also grew up. And I just remember also we were having vigils for um, some of the death row inmates. Um, and we were there keeping, I remember just, you know, when sometimes they'll be on the eve of the execution. 
and I'll be out till pretty late. Then I'll go home and she'll stir a little bit and she'll ask me, where were you, Papa? And then, so you'll tell them, you know, and and, uh, and at those moments, then, you know, you she'll think about it as well and you tell them of your experience and she'll and let her go and figure out what's right and wrong. So, the, you know, your own experience, your own, what you do outside, sometimes you bring it home and use yeah. those as moments that uh, they can actually share experience and, and you use sure. it as an educational sure. tool as well. I think you, you have been quoted to say adversity makes a good teacher. Makes, mm. Yeah, and then I, I fully agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's in the moments, tough moments that the greatest lessons are learned, not just in success. Mm. Um, I guess moving on, uh, thank you so much for sharing about you know, your family. I mean, these are things I probably have not uh, heard you speak before. Yeah, so it really does um, see a, let me see a different side. Uh, okay, I want to move on and talk about mental health, right? Mental health and youth in particular. Because uh, it is a concern in society, especially today, right, where youth are taking their life, not just youth, but people in general. And I want to draw reference to a post that you made recently, right? It's a black and white photo. You were sitting on a pavement with somebody and you wrote a message about your thoughts towards this and some encouragement as well. And it's actually very succinctly written, but there's a lot of meaning inside. So I want to just unpack that meaning, hopefully for viewers to also get some encouragement to go through tough times. So I think I'll just talk about the post a little bit. I think you raised awareness to the suite. I think it was Samaritans of Singapore, right? That was the research where last year, um, youth, I think 94 youth took their lives. And it's been the highest since 1991 of teenage male suicides. And you shared, you rightly pointed out that when the, the hurt that the family and the parents go through is very deep. So as a parent, right, when you looked at this statistic, how do you feel? What's it? I mean, it's unimaginable for someone who has kids of his own for a parent to say goodbye to the children when they take their own lives. And this is something that I felt very deeply about. And if you look at, you know, life when it just opens up to us and it's, I've always told my own children, hey, it's, you know, something that you need to grasp, take a hold of. And it's exciting. The opportunities opening up. So you just imagine, you know, when you get up to a stage when in the deeper recesses of your mind, you actually contemplate of taking your own life. Just imagine, and then you actually act on yeah. it. Uh, just imagine the darkness okay. that that individual must be going through. And there must be something society can do about it, isn't it? I mean, apart from the fact that if you are clinically, you, you know, diagnosed yeah, yeah. As, as depressed, uh, but then those just yeah, that, that's so a separate yeah. Them, yeah. But then at the same time, even those you, you do need support networks yeah. to keep you going. And I just find that um, if you don't get society to pay attention to these issues, we tend to be, live very atomized lives, very insulated from one another, and there isn't that kind of network, and you, that, that that whole self value isn't there. And you couple that nowadays with, with cyberbullying, when people are just you know sitting behind the, your, your keypad, yeah. um, so easy to type out words that can be very hurtful and so on. That adds to the seriousness of the problem. Yeah. But I'm just glad to, to see that at least society is now slowly also beginning to, yeah. to wake up to this problem. And for what it's worth, you know, for me to be able to add some voice into it, sure. I'll do what I can. And I think in that post as well, the Facebook post, I was scrolling through the comments. And of course, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I don't think she, the person has any reason to lie. So just saying that where she stays, there was a 17-year-old that committed suicide. Yeah. And not just that, um, one month later, um, the mom actually jumped from the same spot. Yeah. So when I when I saw that, I think I really got quite, quite emotional because uh, it's just... Like you see, life is precious and, and for it to be lost just like that is a tragedy. Yeah. And a lot of these sometimes is just, I suppose it's where we are able to help but we fall short. We meaning society, 
um, whether it's the professional sector or more, you know, in terms of the community at large, uh, where we can provide more assistance, more support in there to minimize this kind of uh, tragedy. Um, we should be able to muster enough resources and be able to help the situation. I, I remember when I was doing my undergraduate and towards the tail end of it, I had to do an internship. I was in the US at that time, but then I came back to do a six month internship. I did it with the, um, I think if I'm not mistaken, at that time it was uh, Ministry of Community Affairs. Uh, and I went to a boy's home to do this, this project where I undertook for a few months. Um, this group of boys uh, and just to do um, an assessment pre and post intervention and in between it ran some programs for them but shortly thereafter I had to stop because I had to go back and it was an internship and I just distinctly remember also, should I have done this program because it was an internship for yeah. me it was a program but for them it was um their lives yes, exactly. so when i and another time they got very then we got very uh, I, I visited them sometimes even on a daily basis and i took them out and i just remember towards again the end of the program i said i wanted the facility the boys the, the home to allow me to take them i said no this is risk risky high risk what did they rent i said where, where can they run to Right, and I said I'm willing to take that that chance. So I just remember said then they said okay, you know. In the end, we had this back and forth, and they said okay, but the responsibility is yours, and so on and so forth. And then I, I thought, am I making a mistake? But in the end, I said no, I'll take them out. So I remembered I just talked to them. I said, hey, look, you know, I'm just going to take you out, uh, um, and I'm just going to trust you. If you go out, you run, and there are five of you. I can't do anything about it. But I just want you to know that, you know, I, I, I trust you enough. That I want you to go out and start uh, um, experiencing, experiencing what other kids and, and, and hopefully be able to influence you enough for you to uh, uh, get back into mainstream society. We did. Okay. And, you know, they, they, we went out, we came back. and But unfortunately, uh, years later, I, I found out that one of them committed suicide. Or rather, I shouldn't use the word committed, isn't it? Took their own, took his own life, and um, that impacted me as well. And it, these are things that I honestly feel that if we professionalized the sector and involve the community, educate the public, and to see where how mental health can be helped, yeah, exactly. that all yeah. builds into a program yeah. which I think will be tremendously beneficial to our, our yeah. youth. And I definitely want to talk about that with you as well because in the later part of your post, you did prescribe, not really prescribe, more of just share from your experiences, encouragement to the young friends. And I just want to read it out a little bit because I feel that some elements, you, you talked about it, but I want to go in depth into it. You shared that uh, to my young friends who feel vulnerable, the hopelessness and despair that you feel is real and cannot be talked or even medicated away. Digging deep to manufacture the will to press on in search for a brighter and more hopeful day is what you must do. I know mental health, I know mental strength is easily prescribed, but however difficult to achieve and sustain. But here's the good part, it's not impossible. It starts with knowing who you are and what you are and coming to take pride in a person that you wake up to every morning. And mom and dad, you've got a gigantic role to play too. I think when I read this, right, uh, one element you alluded to is hope. And, and I was speaking to a mental health researcher recently, right, that he's researching into recovery in the Asian context. And he was saying that some factors that are more salient in recovery, at least in the Asian context, right, number one is social connectedness, what you mentioned earlier. And a newer element that comes up recently is hope. Just having that hope that there's going to be a better day, which avenues, what avenues we can provide hope to these people. And I want to ask you, right, like you mentioned that hope starts with knowing who you are and taking pride in the person. It, it seems to me like it's a bit on self-worth and self-esteem. Um, how do we, how can someone take pride or begin to take pride in themselves, right? Especially when 
their self-worth is dependent on so many variables like their grades, achievements, whatever. Yeah. For me, I can only relate from my own personal experience and that is to, to not be so parochial, so narrow in your definition of what is a successful person. Because if, if you were to measure yourself in terms of what everybody else measures as a, what a successful person is, you, you, the tendency is for us to begin to look at our bank accounts, what kind of cars we drive, the kinds of house that we live in. And then you begin to uh, even denigrate yourself in terms of, hey, I can't I make it. it. Yeah. Um, I can't, I'm not as successful as the next guy. But if we were to broaden just our vistas just a little bit more, our definition of what makes a person worthy, then I think we can escape this problem of just being defined by others, you see. And I know it takes a lot in the sense of knowing yourself, developing a sense of self-confidence, but it really is something which I suppose you've got to try to de de think about it and make sure you, you, you devote that time uh, to figuring out what you want to do. Um, and I'm not talking in terms of, of career paths and that, that kind of thing, but to, to be able to tell yourself what you want to achieve in life. Um, and at the end of the day, when you look back, have you lived a life examined? And if you have, is that something you're going to be contented with? And in between everything else, how much money you make in between, uh, that becomes secondary. If you can figure out that for yourself, then I think that that whole idea of just being determined and therefore being more resilient then becomes stronger. very real, yeah, very real yeah, and, and stronger. Yeah, it's actually quite powerful you're sharing because like self-esteem, right? One thing when building self-esteem is to build on something that's constant, something that's unchanging because if we build it on variables, those variables can change anytime. And if like you set a definition of success in all those variables, then you tend to compare and you tend to feel that you lack something and that affects you a lot. Um, but, but having, like you said, knowing who you are and what you want to achieve and, and that's unique to you, that no one can take that away from you. And so... Yeah, I appreciate you just sharing your thoughts. I think it will definitely help the audience a lot, just redefining our meaning of success. And in between, of course, I mean, things are never going to go from point A to point B in one smooth gap. You're going to, as I said, experience a lot more failures and rejection than you are, at least for most of us anyway. But every time you, you, you falter, you fall, um, you've got to sometimes even just very consciously tell yourself, even if your darkest moments, um, to to give yourself that hope, that target which you want to to hit next, and then say, "Hey, look, this is just a setback. It's not um, the end. It's not the death of what you want to achieve." And a lot of times, you, you know, even when, for example, we fall ill. Right, and we take a medicine, you know, that the doctor prescribes. Why do we do that? We do that in the hope of getting better, isn't it? So we can get back on track again. So that whole idea of hope motivates us into taking medicine and doing whatever yeah. we get resting it's up. Faith and that yeah, get that's right. That's right. So in the same thing for your own psychological health, it's important to also know that you've got to do certain things. Take your medication, your 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 yeah social medication, if you will. But then you're always striving to make sure that you want to get better, even if it's just for the episode, so you can get back on track and making sure that then your destination is still something that you've got to work towards. Okay, that's, that's a very nice sum, summing up of our part on resilience and mental health. Um, speaking of definition of success, I think it's good to lead on to the next segment, which is youth and education. Because that's where our definition of success usually begins. Um, and I think you're both very passionate about this, so I guess we have a lot to talk about. Um, why, why youth? Why do you take extra effort to engage youth like me, or even you know now you set up an arm youth arm as well? Who we are when in, we are in our thirties and forties and well into our uh, middle age and, and older age, all begins from that those 
foundational, those formative years. And it's during those years where we're looking out for ourselves, where what mom and dad can do then becomes more and more limited because then we've got to figure things out. And I just went through period this period as well. And I come back again to the point where I was uh, doing my A-levels and constantly feeling, having this feeling of inadequacy that mm. I'm not good enough. Sure. And partly it was because of the system that kept hitting you over the head and said, you're only good enough for this yep. and not something else. And at some point, I just felt that I had to get out of the system. Um, and, and, and I managed... Uh, yeah. uh, to, to get myself out and, and go to the US and I remember going when I first stepped into uh, the university at the, the, uh, in the US and my major professor was seated behind his desk and he asked me okay tell me what you want to do this semester and I was looking at him and said but why are you asking yeah. me shouldn't you be telling <laughs> me this, this semester I'll do yeah. this and next semester do that and then he was explaining to me, and, you know, and, and you even though this may be your major, you've got other electives and so on. And so on, you figure it for yourself. And very far, you soon you find yourself having this, this, you need to take control of it. And then they kept telling you that treating you as an individual rather than just another number in a statistic. And I very soon found myself growing, not just socially, but intellectually as well, which I never kind of took pride in it. And so, you know, one thing led to another and I found myself really began to, to be immersed in my own academic uh, development. And it wasn't that things was not difficult. It was hard, but if you are motivated in what you were doing, then half the battle is won because then you find even though it's hard work, you're able to wake up every morning and say, hey, this is what I want to achieve and, and you want to go for it, that kind of thing. And very soon you find yourself just going from one goal to another and, and being able to excel. And that's why I found it so discouraging when I see um, even our own Singaporeans, young Singaporeans having to go through what they're going. And I come back to this whole thing about not being really able to figure things out, but rather month in, month out, having to finish the syllabus yeah. and then regurgitate it for the exams. And that can be so, so discouraging. It, it is how we define education, right? We have a very narrow definition of education. I think one thing I share with students that you reminded me when you were speaking, right, is that education is not confined to a textbook in four walls. Right? It's confined only by the limits of our imagination, our thirst for that knowledge, that curiosity for learning, and the and irony is that I went to decent schools, so I inverted commas, but it's only after I, I went out, had informal mentorship, I read beyond the textbook, where I really yeah. discovered the essence of education. Yeah. It's so yeah. different, I was so much more motivated, so much more alive. Is it not? <laughs> oh, when you begin to figure out yeah. for yourself that, right? Yeah, and it pains me when I see kids dragging their feet to school because they confuse schooling with education. Schooling is just one part of education, it's not education as a whole. Um, well, wasn't Mark Twain who equipped yeah. that, you know, I learned despite my education. And Never let schooling get in the way of education. Yes. Not win. Yeah. And there's a lot of wisdom in that. You know, the saddest part of it is that because we keep drilling our students and they, they equate picking up a book with just exams so that at the final exam when I took, whether it's at A-levels or, you know, whether it's even at the university, when I don't have to pick up another book again, right, it means that, you know, that's the end of my learning career yeah. so I'm home free yeah. but they never equate picking up a book with learning and developing yourselves uh, and picking up new skills those kinds of things to them education is a fixed destination right and I tell them clearly when I go anytime I go to a classroom that education is not like you get grades you get achievements you graduate and you're educated it's not education is a journey that is so enriching it's a privilege that you can learn something um I'd like to ask, you know, I mean, now going to transitioning to the education system, before we talk about the gaps and things to improve on, is there any good points about our system? <laughs> Anything that, you know, you value? I, I seriously would like to, to get into a, a, find an area which I can say, hey, look, you know, it was something that's laudable. 
But through the years, and when I say years, it goes back to the 1990s, but almost 30 years that I've been talking about this already, that we cannot continue to put this kind of pressure and, and think that what we did before is going to be the system that's going to bring our students, our society at large, the kind of success that we've seen in the past. You just cannot continue doing what we've done before and figuring out that, hey, you know, we succeeded in the past, so we we're going to succeed in the future. That is the kind of thing that I've, I've been very concerned about. And even when I was at the university, I remember writing quite a few letters to Straits Times and talking about the futility of just this rote learning and streaming pupils at an early age and just, you know, putting up them and pastoring out into different, you know, zones and different aptitudes and different skills that they have, even at that early age. And how do you, you know, the human mind, the human behavior is so it's complex, complex that, okay, that there's no way that you're going to be able to make all these predictors and, and mm. think that they're going to work out for you later on in life, isn't it? So my point at that time was let them grow. Let them grow, let them find themselves. And then we begin to uh, test them and begin to see how far they can go. Um, that was that part of it that I just felt that um, the education has been just sure. so sclerotic. It's, it kind of reminds me of like a factory analogy, right? Like formal education is modeled after the industrial revolution. So in a way, schools are like factories. Both of them have bells. Both of them have raw material. And they're put through, you know, a certain checks and certain tests to produce like a standard product at the end. And those, when it doesn't meet that criteria of the standard product, in a factory it gets thrown out. But of course, in our context, we fall through the cracks, students, yeah. and they get this illusion. It's more like an assembly line, yeah. isn't it? And then, you know, the ones that don't, you know, pass quality control, you know. But you think about it, and how much talent are we wasting? Because a lot of people are just later developers, and if you begin to only tell them you're good enough for this type of school and that kind of cause, um, they don't discover themselves. I've, you, you've seen many of these people who make it good later in life are those people who don't excel early on. So it's just a huge wastage of resources in there. And I think at some point there must be be reform, which we've been talking about, and hopefully it'll come sooner rather than later. I'm reminded also of a study, uh, I think it's a PISA study. I mean, for viewers, PISA stands for I think, Program for International Student Assessment. It's just an assessment that pits students from different countries and compares them. So there was a recent study about the fear of failure. And in Singapore, right, 75% of students fear failure. It's higher than the global average. And this particular one thing surprised me. Out of over 70 countries that took the test, we ranked the highest in terms of the statement that says, I'm fearful for my future when I fail. We had the highest, 78% agree or uh, strongly agree. Are you surprised by that? No, because years ago, I did come across another study where they compared a student's uh, of four or five different countries. And Singapore students were the only ones that said, what was the biggest thing you feared? In other countries, students said, fear of my parents passing away. Singaporean students said, fear of failing an exam. And it's just, again, so sad when you look at the context of it that we've inculcated in our children that your biggest fear in life is to fail an exam. So much so that a lot of times they begin to think that exams define them, you see. And in the, the worst thing is that it's, it's prevailed to, to today. And I just cannot understand why with, you know, um, an enlightened system globally, people are talking about it. And you see change, development of technology where you really are depending more on ideas and thinking out of the box, innovation and so on and so forth, that we're still so stuck in a system where exams is the be-all and end-all of, of um, education. So I, I just think that the, the longer we, we wait, yeah. we continue to kick the can down the road, and that, that's going to affect us tremendously in our yeah. future. And fear, fear is the greatest killer of creativity, right? If you're so yes. afraid to fail, it's step out of that comfort zone. You'll never come up with something original. 
nor be creative, nor like you said, innovate and prepare for the next, um, you know, to thrive in the next 50 years. Um, and, and so I think we know, like I think as a population, we do know that um, root learning stifles creativity, you know, too much focus on tests will lead to pressure and everything. But as a culture, I think we find it hard to change. And so I think now we want to talk about solutions and because you always say like, we talk about problems and no solutions. So we want to talk about solutions. Uh, I, I know the government has kind of recently talked more and more drastic measures, at least in comparison to the past, like, how they remove subject-based um, stream. I think it was subject-based bending, right? Phasing out academic streams, PSLE scoring. Um, do you think it's a step in the right direction? Do you feel like culture still needs to change? You know, I fear that a lot of times uh, we're just using buzzwords to placate rather than really think about genuine reform. And, you know, this whole idea of teach less, learn more sounds very nice, doesn't it? But go in and take a look at the curriculum and the, the syllabus of, of some of these. They just piled on more and more. And then now you add CCA in. And students are just put under more and more pressure just to perform, get the grades, and then we begin to sift out those that can really perform versus those not. And I remember as early as uh, primary five, we already screened them for gifted education program. And then after that, secondary two again, and secondary Three, four, yeah. and then right through all, all the way, they were always assessing them. And so I, I just fear that that kind of a system, it just doesn't, education system doesn't, doesn't facilitate critical thinking independent thinking which is so essential for us going forward she remind me of a book that I read uh, it's Up Close and Personal uh, by Lee Kuan Yew I think it was written as an essay of different collections of his friends uh, of recounts of him so this recount was written by Robert Kwok I think he's a uh, malicious richest man I mean he's a business magnate he was saying that he, his, Lee Kuan Yew was his coll- uh, classmate back in Raffles at that time and back in 2010 you know, Lee Kuan Yew actually wrote to him and asked him, right, because when he visited Hong Kong, he was amazed by what he saw, the innovation, the enterprising spirit that came out of it. He was wondering why, we you know, it's not just data here. So he was asking Robert, you know, of his views. So Robert said, okay, I'm going to just give it to him straight. He said that, he wrote to Lee Kuan Yew and said that in your zeal and impatience to build Singapore, you might have straight-jacketed the population. You have to take a scissors and cut them loose. You know, they have a lot of genius, but it's just hidden. So uh, he just reminded me when you, you talked about it. Um, so if you were the education minister, hypothetically, what would you <laughs> do? Well, the, the, the thing is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are other many systems already that have done and gone through some of these um, systems that have found that if we get students to always take exams and worse to you uh, rank them all right either by school or if they're within classes against each other so they're always competing with each other and we almost think as if that knowledge is f- a finite thing mm. right it is different from like say for example if there's a dollar over there i take the dollar yeah. you won't have that one dollar but it's not like knowledge isn't it if i take that knowledge you're not going to have that knowledge so I keep saying, don't let's not compare them and then don't rank schools. I know that they don't do it nowadays, but every yeah. you know and parents do it all the time, isn't it? Like yeah. But you know, when you for example, in, in some of the uh, more advanced uh, systems, they don't want students to compare their grades. So teachers are not allowed to tell yeah. other students or rank them what your score is and it's always you and how you develop yourself compared to yourself rather than to other students so this whole idea of just you know putting in dumping content and expect them to then memorize it and then reproduce that kind of uh, information during exam time and then later compare and rank each other so that you know that you're going to a better school, you don't go to a better school, you take this course and not that course. I think that wisdom dictates that we need to move away from that kind of a system. Right, to a more hands-on approach. In fact, I do remember when I was in Victoria School, uh, we call it teaching for understanding. I enjoyed it, set one and set two. 
And some of my classmates are complaining about it because a lot of projects, but I enjoy it. Because going out there interviewing people, you know, and they, and they assess us based on also our projects. And so I really enjoy it. It taught me a lot of things that otherwise wouldn't have happened if I just read the textbook. Yeah, so I guess we move towards that direction. It's a good direction to move towards. And you also realize that you, you learn best when you either you, when you watch something. You, you know how it is when you sometimes a, a, a scene that you've, you, you've mm. watched or you've seen uh, impacts and stays in your memory a lot more, yeah. right? Um, and your interaction with people, you remember it sometimes. Even smells, yeah, for, even what you sure. hear triggers yeah. off memories. But when you actually sit in front of your book, right, and the dry words are there and you're trying to absorb it passively, sure, you can memorize it for this next couple of months until the exams. But what happens after that? You tend to forget it as quickly as you've, you've learned it, you see. So we've, we've got to get more enlightened in our approach to education. I think the last question on this segment, something I would definitely want to ask you because you talk a lot about social mobility, helping the less fortunate, underprivileged. And when we and that starts so partly with, with youth, right? When you're young, how do you help them to thrive? And when I think of this, right, I usually think of two broad factors that come into play that are seemingly at odds with each other. I use the word seemingly because I think there's a balance, but I'd like to hear from you. On one hand, right, there's the mindset of hard work. Right, that the key to success is not resources, it's your resourcefulness. That the circumstances doesn't make you, right? It merely reveals you to yourself. But on the other hand, resources, environment, privilege does matter. So how, how do you then balance both? Which factor is more important? I always think of it in terms of, you know, when, when you have a, say, water and then there's sediment in there. When you shake it up, everything's mixed up, isn't it? All right. But soon, very soon, things settle down, right? And then you get these layers. And then you find that the layers then become very, very fixed. Yeah. And if you don't shake things up again, then it becomes very calcified. And very soon, they form up layers which are more or less permanent. I see society very much in that, and using that analogy now. When things started off 1950s, 1960s, things were still very, and we were all equally poor. So everybody was finding their way up. And you, you know, people of my generation would, a lot of them came from very poor backgrounds and so on and so forth. But if you, as you go ahead in society, you find that the people and research data bears this out, isn't it? That people who are now more successful tend to become come from more successful families and households and so on. And if you look at it, you know, again, you look at the cohorts that actually make it into, uh, say, the university, right, tend to actually come from families that were better off years before already. I'm afraid that as we keep going on in this uh, direction, on this mode, you will get very a, a much greater stratification of society, meaning that people, social mobility then becomes a lot more limited. And that's why there is a always a call to say that, hey, look, when you start off in life, nobody is saying that everybody's equal. We all understand that no two persons are, and therefore the opportunities that, that come available to you is what you make of it. That's one aspect of it. But everybody should at least have that equal opportunity when they start off in, in life. And that really then comes to back to education. And I've always believed that education is that, that, that great leveler. But when you look at it right now, um, it, it doesn't stand that test, isn't it? Because uh, the difference between neighborhood schools and your so-called top, schools, your branded schools, elite schools. Um, you can say all, you can come up every, with all the rhetoric you want, right? Yeah, every school is a good school, but you know in yeah. reality the resources are going to these different, yeah. you know, uh, they're very different. So I'd like to see something like that being uh, more resources being provided. And, and one thing that we can do is uh, reduce the ratio between um, teacher, student, and bring it down to 1 to 20. Let's let teachers really do less of admin work um, and, and 
not teach more, but at least be able to interact with students, encourage them, provide skills for them, teach them skills, lessen your content and your syllabus. So all these things all go into the mix, if you will. Yeah, and I think when, when that happens as well, teachers have more time to mentor, to be a, in a way like a, a role model to the students. And that also helps to build their mindset. Mm. Right, it also helps to build their self-efficacy and their belief in themselves, which is also important. And you combine them both, I think that can help a student to try for at least move forward in life in a positive way. Yeah, I, it, it's something which I, I think it can be developed a, a lot more. Last question on this segment, assuming you're a teacher, what is, I mean you were, <laughs> assuming you're a teacher now, what is a core message that you would share with students? That learning is is exciting and you you know if you begin to discover for yourself find that skill to be able to kind of propel yourself forward that is going to be that factor that makes the difference between you being able to be successful Mm -hmm. and again i want to caution come back what the definition of successful And that will make a difference now. But of course, it's easier said than done because if, as an educator, if you're not there to be able to impart those values and to let people learn, that that learning is fun, it's exciting, then, you know, the dry bones of just teaching and looking at the whiteboard and, and, you know, that's going to be a problem now. I remember this when I was teaching at the university anyway. um, I, students have, my former students have come out and say, hey, can you remember you brought your dog to your really? lecture? Yeah. <laughs> so at the time I had my, uh, a couple of German shepherds and I was training them. So, you know, I was teaching the chapter on uh, the, the topic on behavior modification. So I brought the dogs into, you know, I was teaching how you reinforce behavior, you punish behavior, then you can shape behavior from that, in that sense. And then, you know, a couple of times I also said, hey, let's get out of the classroom. I can't stand it. So, you know, so dry for me anyway. So we just go down to the canteen or sit down at the foyer there. And, you know, rather than a format where you're just teaching using your chalkboard and your transparency, you know, just have them communicate and ask questions and that, those kinds of things. And there are different ways that you can make, uh, uh, take the classroom out of, take them out of the classroom, but still be able to, get some of the things, achieve some of the things that you want to do in the classroom. Okay. Okay, Dr. Chi, we are coming towards the end of the podcast. But before we end, we have a final segment, which I named Dr. Chi's Reflections and Resilience. So I'm going to ask you 11 questions, quick fire questions to hopefully give uh, the viewers some insights in your resilience and tenacity. You have about 30 seconds max to answer each question. I am very bad at this, just to let you know, for me. <laughs> if, you, if you go a little bit beyond 30 seconds, it's fine. Okay, you ready? I'll try. <laughs> what does resilience mean to you? Being able to get up every time you fall and then to be able to even become even more robust in what you want to achieve in your attitude. You share one quote or mantra that has kept you strong in your toughest times? That's the hackneyed phrase, right? Of of that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. How can we build resilience in youth? Give them the tools that they need to discover themselves and not constantly knock them over the heads that they must do well in their exams. You met your wife at the University of Georgia where you encouraged her to pursue a PhD by saying you got to have dreams in life. And she wrote that it was cliche but effective. Why is it important to dream? To continue to hope, to have things to look forward to. And even though you may not achieve your ideal, your, your dream, so to speak, you nevertheless need something to continue to propel you forward. When was the last time you teared? Ah. Oh, that's not too hard because just last week my mother passed away. Um, it, it was a lot harder to take than I 
you know, had Imagine intellectual it. intellectualized it, but it has these raw moments like, when you see her in the coffin and uh, that was really hard to take. You've been quoted to say that adverse conditions make good teachers. Why do you say that? Again, you know, if you, you look back in your own lives, the most painful moments are always the ones that you remember best and the ones that you're just having frivolous fun. That's not what you remember the most, isn't it? And But the one thing that you must not allow is that it have these adversity, uh, adverse events scar you and prevent you from going forward. Um, they're always good masters, but like fire, they're, they're good servants, but they're terrible, terrible masters. So don't ever let that become your your somebody that controls you and somebody something that keeps you from going forward. Sure. Your advice for people who are facing bullying or discrimination? You've got to be able to stand up and shout back at them and say, you're not, you're not going to defeat me. And if I have to take my last breath to tell you uh, that you will not get the better of me, I will do it. And you, if you know bullies, uh, they tend to feed off fear and when you retreat, so you stand up to them and you push forward and you will see them back off. Okay. Do you have any words of encouragement for people who might be facing a mental health condition or going through a challenging period in their lives? There's always something out there. There's always something, someone out there who, who, who you, whom you've not found yet that must excite you, that must give you encouragement to want to go on. And whether it's an event, whether it's your, your, your life partner or even a friend, you want to go and you want to discover it. Because if you don't and you stop short, you may be selling yourself short and not really being able to experience something that could be very wondrous. So keep on, keep, keep on keeping on. Recently, you fought a very long and tough campaign, uh, which you narrowly lost out. And in the reaction interview, you know, I could see that for the first time, right, your voice was shaky and I could feel the pain and disappointment. One week later, less than a week later, you were on your feet serving residents. How? How do you find the strength to do it? You know, this is one of those questions which sometimes, as long as I've thought about it and tried to analyze it, I, I cannot give you a good answer in that sense of how do I do this? How do I? It's just, I know that at those points I feel um, very dejected, um, sometimes even demoralized. But you tell yourself, if you must, sit down, rest for a while. But at some point, you've got to get up again. And you've got to not let it get the better of you. And then you begin to wallow in self-pity and feeling very sorry for yourself. But you must also know that there are other people who uh, depend on you as well. So you, you, you get up and you say, hey, I'm, I'm going to, to do this even if, if as painful as things are, even as tired as I am, but just make sure that, hey, uh, you, you screw up enough gumption and courage to, to move ahead. Even, and you don't, you, you know, you don't do it because you're not feeling tired or you're not feeling fearful anymore. You do it despite you feeling tired and, and you're feeling fearful. And that is courage. Not because it's absence of fear, but be, Despite of what you're feeling, you just even if you're cracking inside, you're crying inside. Get up. Nobody wants to to, to look at, at at somebody who's always down and out. But pe derive people derive courage by looking at you as well. And if you can actually show people how you move forward, then mm. hey, that's one better thing that you can do in life, isn't it? Right. The so last question: Why do you do what you do? You know, you live life once, and if you look at it. You know, modern humans came about a hundred to a hundred thousand years ago, right? And evolution just allows us to live more than what maximum now, say a hundred years now. And after that, you go into 
uh, non-existence again, right? If you don't believe in the afterlife. So you're here for that one brief moment in history. What are you going to do about it, right? Are you just going to be here to say, I'm going to look after myself, just take care of you know me and mine? Or do you want to leave a mark and better the lot around you at least to whatever extent that you can you know, bring joy to people whom you come across with, influence them, make life better for them as well. And not just your family, but you know, your peers, your family, society in large. And what you leave behind, I think it's more important than what you um, go on from day to day without really thinking about um, tomorrow. On behalf of your supporters and from my heart, thank you, Dr. Chi, for joining us today. Thank it's you. been an absolute pleasure to host you. I will treasure this for a long time. Thank yeah. you so much for this afternoon. And uh, yeah, I wish you and your family all the best. You know, we have come to the end of this podcast. Uh, do you have any last messages you want to share with the audience? I, I, I think I, I better... Uh, stop while I'm ahead otherwise I might say something really goofy and my <laughs> kids will be there and say oh no Papa not again with that kind. Okay. so thank you so much for having me it's, it's been a pleasure sure alright we come to the end if you did enjoy it uh, do subscribe for, for future episodes with that stay healthy stay resilient and we'll see you all next time alright bye take care bye bye